That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about the Josephine Baker story. And why is that? So this was supposed to be a live review, but my plans changed. So, uh, but the, the theme for the live review was Lynn Whitfield because I was under the impression that May 6th is her birthday, but apparently her birthday is February 15th. <laughs> so I don't know how I messed that up, but because I thought the day we're publishing this video is her birthday, I chose her as the theme and the poll options were Stomping at the Savoy, The Wedding, Medea's Family Reunion, Mama, I Want to Sing, and The Josephine Baker Story. The Josephine Baker Story won with 52% of the votes. The only movie of the list I've seen is Medea's Family Reunion. Had you seen any of these films? These, I, I'm a big Lynn Whitfield fan, and these are five that I hadn't seen, which is why I picked them. Yeah. Uh, because I don't really care for uh, the thin line between love and hate, which people keep asking about. Um, yeah, we didn't choose that one because we've seen it more than once, and I don't really care for that movie. I don't think that's a very well done <laughs> film, despite liking her. Um, or Head of State, I do really like her in, but that was more of a supporting role. But, um, so, yeah, I, Medea's Family Reunion is one of the few Tyler Perry movies I have not seen. That's a Medea film, um, so I, I'm curious to see that because the year was I wasn't paying attention to him that year that came out, but uh, I would have been happy to watch any of these. I was really excited to potentially watch Mama. I want to sing. Uh, <laughs> it looks like it would be a lot of fun. We do have the DVD now, mm -hmm. so I probably will make a video for it. I wanted to see Jumping at the Savoy. That's what I voted Stomping. for. Stomping, Stomping at the Savoy because Vanessa Bell Calloway and uh, Vanessa L. Williams are both in there. But the Josephine Baker story won. It was an HBO film that came out in 91. Yep, which uh, Lynn Whitfield won an Emmy for. I think this movie is okay. The production value is better than your average TV film. Unfortunately, I feel like the script is just your standard biopic. Like, broad strokes, really wide timeline. So everything feels kind of diluted. And the story... I didn't love the screenplay, and I feel like it's missing... It's missing a lot. A lot, so... Because we kind of just zip, zip, zip through her life. But Lynn Whitfield is... Uh, when Lynn Whitfield is captivating as Josephine Baker. Transfix. I mean, she's beautiful. Yeah. So the, she's definitely the highlight. Uh, so she is directed by Brian Gibson, who's probably best known for What's Love Got to Do With It, which he did right after this. Um, but he also did Poltergeist 2. Uh, at the time that he directed the Josephine Baker story, he was married to Lynn Whitfield. Mm. Okay, I'm going to try to tell the story of the movie. It starts in 1969, and we see that Lynn, uh, Josephine Baker is living in a castle in France. Mm -hmm. She's on the verge of bankruptcy, and she has 12 adopted children who she has to send away because she can't afford to take care of them. So we know how things are going to end. But we start with her as a young child, I believe in like 1919. 17. 17. And we see that one of the first memories she shares is in St. Louis, Missouri, where she was born. Um, there was an attack on her community uh, of white men. And there were several casualties. But we see a young Josephine Baker witnessing this, being very scared and running away. And that's sort of the theme of her life is that she ran and ran until she found her place, which was ultimately in France. But in between that early memory to when she ends up in France, we see her performing as a teenager. And I thought an interesting plot point that's made that seems funny based on the casting of Josephine Baker is that as a teenager, she's saying like, well, because a lot of her acting is like kind of like vaudeville, circusy type. And she says, well, I'm not pretty enough or based on how I look, I have to be funny. Mm hmm. And then we cut to Lynn Whitfield. <laughs> so it's like you cast the most beautiful woman imaginable to play this woman who sort of felt like her awkward appearance forced her to be funny. Mm -hmm. But she gets some gigs on Broadway when she's offered a chance to go to France. Mm -hmm. And it's at this point where the film tells us she's already married because her mom is like, what about your husband? She's like, well, I don't really see him anymore. We can get into that. Her first but, husband. Yes. Yeah. So she ends up in France, and she's a huge success. Her career kind of goes in a, direct, a direction she didn't want because she ends up sort of performing 
topless and more sexy reviews versus I think she wanted to be like a more serious actor. And well, she was known for the banana dance wearing this. Yeah. So she meets a guy who's calling himself the Count, but this is like a a persona he's made up. So he's kind of like a con artist and a gigolo, Mm -hmm. but, and he's played by Ruben Blades. But with Josephine, he's actually uh, honest with her and he really does want to make her a star. And he does. We gloss over her film career, but we see that he really did make her a star and keeps trying to convince her, you need to go to Hollywood, Mm -hmm. you need to go to Hollywood. She ultimately agrees to go to Broadway if she can have a show under her own conditions. So she goes and the show is a complete failure for a number of reasons. And the critics are panning it. So she tells her, the the count she's saying is her husband, but he's not. She sends him back to France because he failed her. And she meets, well, then she... And then he immediately dies. He dies. Then Craig T. Nelson's in the film. As Walter Winchell. As Walter Winchell. And he makes kind of a star out of her by hyping her up in the news. But then there's an incident where she is not served at a restaurant because she's black and she causes a stink because Walter Winchell was in the restaurant. So he kind of like drags her. And in the course of like a six week period, she goes from the highest of highs to the lowest of lows, which forces her to leave the U.S. Mm -hmm. And at this time, she's already married her fourth and last husband, Joel Bouillon, played by David Dukes. Uh, And we also are neglecting... That's such an unfortunate name, because whenever I think of David... Well, there's David Duke, Mm -hmm. who was the former uh, Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan, who's still alive. It's an unfortunate name, (laughs) It's an unfortunate name. And that actor we know from what? Catch the Heat, which uh, is this uh, Sterling Siliphant film that he wrote in 1987, starring Rod Steiger, that's really bad. I would recommend that movie. Uh, And we also saw him in Volker Schlondorf's The Handmaid's Tale as the doctor that tries to offer Natasha Richardson... Oh, that's him? ...something on the side to get her pregnant. Uh, But we also glossed over a character in the Josephine Baker story, played by Louis Gossett Jr., who is also integral in this version of... uh, putting her back on the rise in Europe before she comes back to the U.S. So she meets Joe Bouillon, but because she's gone out of favor in the U.S., she goes back to France. And then we see this is where she starts. We need to get into it, but she has a medical condition that renders her sterile. So when she gets back to France with Joe Bouillon, they start adopting kids. And then we get this montage of her adopting these 12 children and Joe saying, like, I can't. I can't do this, so he leaves. At number six, he's like, that's the last one. <laughs> right. And then six more come. So that's when we get to her on the verge of bankruptcy. She actually loses her house in a scene that was pretty campy, mm-hmm. which we can talk about. And then at the end of her life, we see that Grace Kelly, after learning of Josephine's financial hardships and effectively being homeless, offers her, Grace Kelly offers Josephine her apartment in France. Mm -hmm. And then we also find out that Grace Kelly, along with some other investors, helped produce Josephine's final show, which was supposed to be a retrospective, like a 50-year retrospective. And it's a huge hit. Like, opening night is packed with all the celebrities, rave reviews. And then after the second performance, Josephine goes home and dies in bed. Mm -hmm. I think from, like, a cerebral hemorrhage or something. The end. Um, There's so much happening... She's such an interesting, like, figure. Mm -hmm. And I feel like there could have been so many angles that that this story could have been approached from that could have been more specific and better developed. Yes. Because as it is, it feels very watered down. You already alluded to this, but we really don't... Not only do we not get into her marriages, but we also really don't get into her sexuality. Of course. And not even the fact that, you know... One of her husbands says she was bisexual and had many relationships with women. That's not told in this movie. We don't get any of that, but we also don't really get her sexuality with any of these men. Right. She doesn't seem enthusiastic about any of them. The only thing that she she really feels passionate about, it seems, are these, these babies. And we don't really reconcile the fact that because we don't see her sexuality really in any way, the fact that her persona, her public persona, was one of a very sexualized character. Mm-hmm. So I found that very odd. 
But I'm just going to go through my notes. There's a lot that's very odd, but it's disorienting because it's not clear how much time has passed. They do give us some uh, time markers, but they're kind of sporadic. Uh, because for most of it, I felt like, wait, how much time has passed? When, are, yeah. when did she do these movies? Because she did a handful of films that were no. Well, the film doesn't time. address a single movie she did. No. Which I find odd. Yes. But broad strokes, like, like so Josephine's mother mm-hmm. is just painted as like a straight up hater. Because we're told that the mom had aspirations to be a dancer. Mm-hmm. And then just hated Josephine the minute, even before she goes to France. Just mm-hmm. like hates the fact that she's doing something she wanted to do. And up until the mom dies in a very sort of like made for TV way, mm-hmm. dropping 12 glasses of lemonade, mm-hmm. seemed to not approve of her daughter. When the, when uh, Josephine goes back to France, ostensibly with her tail between her legs and brings mama with, she's the mom's like, I'm not going to learn French. <laughs> Just telling you right now. I'm like, okay. Early on in the film, we hear Josephine say, one dance had made me the most famous woman in the world. And I feel like the movie feels like that. Like, oh, just like all of a sudden we're told like she's the most famous woman in the world. But it's like from what? We just see like one performance. Shaking those tail feathers. And that's it. There, there's no sense of... If you didn't know who this woman was watching this film, it would be confusing. Like, why was she a success? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you wouldn't know exactly. And then this whole thing with Ruben Blades, who I really didn't like... Up until his very last scene, which is the goodbye scene, is the only scene I felt really. Is kind he of, the count? Yeah, yeah. That I felt kind of warm to him, uh, for and and then he's gone. But basically, he's presented as doing this Pygmalion thing with Josephine Baker, as that she's his creation. Yeah. And it, I feel like the film drops the ball on that because she's going to these ballerina lessons, even though she's already kind of a dancer and uh, learning how to sing in, in French. But well, I was confused by that because was she learning how to sing or was she recording an album? Like, I don't get a sense of what her abilities were. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not yeah. clear what exactly she was being trained to do for, for what purpose, but there we have it. But when we first meet the Count... I thought that scene where he's trying to pitch to her being her manager, Mm -hmm. I just don't think that that actor, that portrayal, was at the level of, like, Lynn Whitfield's. I agree. I don't think that anything about this film, besides maybe some of the dresses, are at the level of Lynn Whitfield. The production, I mean, they clearly spent money, so it does feel better than your average TV movie. Mm. Yeah. When we hear the reviews from her Broadway show, I mean, it's like... It's like on uh, RuPaul's Drag Race when they have the reading challenge. Oh, the library was open. The library was open. Like, <laughs> they're so atrocious. It's kind of funny. It's funny, but it's also racist. It is. I, it I is. don't think any of the... They were looking for anything that they could possibly say. And unfortunately, there were some, were some things with the production that allowed her to be vulnerable to these scavengers. But Getting back to not getting a sense of how much time has passed, we also hear her character say that she's tired through washed up and looking the best she's ever and then when we see her it's like she couldn't look more beautiful (laughs) flawless like 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 flawless she's like i'm so tired it's like you look really good yeah that i don't know the casting almost is it kind of works against this historical figure because yeah it's hard to hear her say she's washed up and tired and then we see her looking like a 10 10 10 10 well even lynn winfield in old lady makeup is like oh you still look really good at moments, I, I'm still thinking about, or I'm trying to understand how I feel about the the old lady makeup because at moments I think it is effective, but more often than not, I felt like it, it was distracting. Mm-hmm. Like clearly they put stuff in her cheeks to make her look jolly. Um, they're putting like cakey makeup on. They make her look like she's balding. But she they does, paint like frow lines. She doesn't look jolly. She just looks like she had some dental work and she's a little swollen. Yeah. So I don't, I don't know if. Her and old lady makeup was effective. No, but I I do like Lynn Whitfield in this. I don't know that she's exactly giving me Josephine Baker, though. It might be part of the problem as well. Yeah. Because Josephine Baker was more of kind of a physicality than Lynn Whitfield as as a beauty. A beauty, yeah. Yeah. Because I've only actually seen Josephine Baker in Princess Tam Tam. I haven't seen Zuzu or the big the big one is Siren, Siren of the Tropics, but um, which I feel like they should have at least mentioned that. Movie. We don't find out Josephine gave up her U.S. passport to become a French citizen until she's in the hospital for some undisclosed medical reason and Lou Gossa Jr. is playing a military person who's been tasked with opening up like nightclubs that will cater to military staff and he asks Josephine to perform there. 
And she says, I can't because, like, I'm not a U.S. citizen. That, it's not a good look. And then that's when we find out, they, they, they mention, like, three times that she has these secondary, secondary infections. infections. But it's like, what was her primary condition? But well, she's also suffering from a, an emotional malaise. Yeah, they describe it as, like, a malaise. And she's in the hospital. And then the, the doctor performs a surgery. And he's like, sorry, your secondary infections were so bad that now you can't have kids. So I, you know, it's like not really clear like what's going on. Like what? Oh, she had SDI. Like, when Josephine first first meets Joe Bullion, it's at one of those like uh, military based performances, and he's the band leader, and she's just gonna sing a song. And I thought that seems really interesting. It starts off rough because Joe Bullion, before they can even like rehearse or perform, he's like, well, I need to tell you something. I don't think I should be on the same stage as you. Right, because we don't share the same political beliefs. And it's like, uh, we're just here to work, dude. I don't know why he felt the need to do well, that. Well, he's like, I wasn't part of the resistance like you were. And, uh, but I, I didn't, well, I wasn't a collaborator. I just worked, work, work through the occupation. Like, but okay. I did think that that scene ends in a very interesting way because that's when we start seeing Josephine be inspired to assist in like, integ like racial integration and it's because we have all the white soldiers in front of the stage and all the black soldiers in the back and she encourages them to mix. Well, she's like, I'm going to have a problem singing this song with the way this audience is set up. So I thought that was a powerful moment. Yeah, about her using her platform to go back to the U.S. and, and spread this uh, awareness. But I think that's where we get... In, in the film, I think, tries to show that but is, is also skirting around it how, about how she's kind of out of touch as well. Well, we need to talk about that. So I think the final act of the film is a very different vibe it feels kind of campy and over the top like it almost felt like great gardens to me because we see older josephine baker literally barricading herself in her castle and this up until this point the story has been using a framing device where because it, it opened in the late 60s and she starts writing a letter to her children and that's kind of how we get all these flashbacks like to when she was a young girl in 1917, blah, blah, blah. And then, of course, when she gets evicted, that device ends. But it's so loose that I felt like when it happened, I was a little, it was jarring. Like, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, we're doing that. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, the final act of her being the old lady, barricading, and then when the like law enforcement come to literally kick her out of her home because someone else has purchased this castle, that was comical. Because you see little old, Lin, you know, Linwood Fields in old lady makeup in a robe. Like, what are you doing? Stop, stop. stop. And then Put that chair down. these French, like, people who are evicting her are so over the top. Oh, they're breaking in. There's a gang of them. They're uh, destroying her... Um, property. Property. They her, find her banana skirt. Yeah, and some guy, he's doing something vulgar with that. And it's like, what? I don't know. And they literally kick her out, kicking and screaming in the rain. So then the final shot is her of that scene is her sitting on like the stoop in the rain covering herself with a blanket next to some uh french baguettes that are getting wet and some some nasty looking heads of lettuce i don't think that was well done and then when we see her now in paris sort of preparing for her final show she's dressed kind of like a hip grandma because mm -hmm. it's the 70s give me shirley bassey a little bit yes uh so that was i don't know okay what I, I think that this movie, and I know that there are some projects in the works currently, uh, I, I think there were three angles that would have made the most sense for me. One is I think it'd make an amazing story to focus on the period of Josephine's life during World War II when she was part of the resistance. I think that's such a significant thing that this film just kind of like... Well, because we do see a scene of the Gestapo yes. uh, raiding her house. Yeah, like... that would be super interesting. Or... What you already alluded to, Josephine's attempts at sort of her or her interpretation of like civil rights activism in the U.S. feels misguided and out of touch because we get a scene where there are some black people who work in the hotel she's staying in basically saying like it's easy for her to because her whole mod, mantra is like you need to fight every battle. Like anytime you are experiencing racism, you need to fight. And as I'm watching it, I'm like, well, that's easy for you to say because you're rich and famous and no one's going to punch you in the face while there are cameras pointing at you. But these, but every other black American just living here, they can't do that. Well, they can't even afford to step a foot into the places where you're having the problem. Right. So, so. We, so we get a couple of characters actually saying that. I thought that would have been a really fascinating angle and like how, because I was reading more about Josephine Baker and how Coretta Scott King had sort of offered her an opportunity to do some work with her and she declined. I think that would make a very fascinating story. Or 
focus on the end of her life preparing for this like retrospective show mm -hmm. and I, wouldn't it be interesting if like Lynn Whitfield reprised her role she as could. an older woman doing this final show I think that would be immensely captivating but I think because Josephine Baker has such a rich story is she needed more than two hours ten minutes I agree and I agree. for that reason I felt like this felt watered down tedious at times yes or, or focus on her adopting all these damn kids her rainbow oh, tribe yeah because that's giving me very much remember the documentary queen of versailles yes yeah or, that, yeah or of course angelina jolie or mia farrow you know or madonna or oh, speaking of which the dvd we have a cover of that says before madonna before Marilyn, there, there was, was josephine. josephine actually that was my fourth story idea because i thought wouldn't it be fun if someone like a david lynch made a movie you know, not accurate to Josephine's life, but like a Josephine Baker type character mm -hmm. stuck in this castle with these 12 kids and it's like falling apart and she's crazy. You know, or I like, mean, since they want to make movies like Blonde and Paint, I feel like someone should come along and do something artistic with uh, Josephine Baker. Or like Yorgos Lanthimos. Uh, you haven't seen The Favorite yet, but I think he could have done, he could do something very interesting with that too. Uh, I was reading that other actors who were considered for this role were Diana Ross, Diane Abbott, Irene Cara, Holly Robinson Pete, Whitney Houston, and Nana Cherry. Mm -hmm. Those are interesting choices. Mm -hmm. Whitney, I feel like Diana, having all played like Billie Holiday, I can't imagine her doing a made for TV movie in the 90s. About, about Josephine? Yeah. Well, because Lynn was how old? I think about 37. God, she looks she so. She looks breathtaking. Good. I mean, she still does to me, but. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I think that she was interesting casting, and this did a lot for her career. Sure. This film, but yeah, um, yeah. I, I don't know. And some of those others would be interesting. I don't think Whitney. No. <laughs> no. A good choice, but. What would you give this film? Two and a half. I would give it two and a half out of five as well. Uh, you did. I was impressed with how it looked. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I mean, yeah, how it shot the, you know, uh, the composer on the piece was Georges Delarue, who is an Oscar winner. Uh, one of his, the last things he did. You can tell that a lot went into, a lot of thought went into production. But it's, it's interesting thinking about Brian Gibson's this back to back with What's Love Got to Do With It, which was supposed to be a made for television film as well. And then they decided that the quality of it was, uh, you know, much too good. And it's interesting. I don't, I, that's part of the, performances by Fishburne and Angela Bassett and also maybe the script I, I think and, and Tina Turner herself with uh, being a much more contemporary figure I think just fit uh, a yeah. lot better that I think there was a lot more working against having to craft Josephine Baker across several decades that have long since passed because Tina Turner I mean I think there are parallels in the sense that Josephine Baker's life off stage and on stage is as dynamic as someone like a Tina Turner, mm -hmm. like volatile and with huge successes and huge lows. So it's funny that, yeah, this, this film doesn't capture it in the same way. But that's all I have. Yeah, same. Hit the thanks button, listen to our podcast. Bye. <laughs>